Hello, Mage fans, and welcome to Mage the Podcast, the podcast that works hard towards ascension so you don't have to. I'm your host, Adam Simpson. I'm joined today by Terry Robinson, and we are going to take a virtual look at the virtual adepts on Tomes of Magic today. Before we get into it, I thought I might open it up to announcements. Uh, I have a book recommendation. I've been reading more 30s pulp stories lately. I do not have a problem. I can stop reading pulp anytime I want to. I read one of the stories for The Shadow, a kind of early hero character. Uh, Gangdom's Doom was first published in December 1931. I found it in The Shadow Double number 101 from Sanctum Books. This story is a great resource for storytellers and players. At 75 pages, it doesn't take long to read. If you want a city-based story that involves organized crime, there's a lot here to set up your game. A detailed example of rival gangs watching for a chance to dominate each other. You can take characters from this book without changing names to start your game. Their methods, their conflicting goals, everything's there for you. Even though it's the 30s, you don't need to change much of anything to make this work in a modern day setting. Instead of running alcohol, you change it to illegal drugs and done. There are examples of coincidental magic used to work against the gangsters. For players, this is a great example of techniques you can use. When the hero arrives in Chicago, he doesn't know anything, so he starts gathering information and spying on the gangsters. When he learns what the different gangsters are up to, he frustrates some of their plans and then just continues spying. Their true colors come out, the gangsters blame each other, some see opportunities to backstab rivals. As the gangsters react, the hero chooses which schemes to help and which to stop to set the gangsters against each other. With weak magic and patience, the hero clears the path to take out the main bosses. Best of all, when you steal material this old, your players will not be familiar with it. So Terry, did you have any announcements today? That kind of reminds me of a thing that there was a magician by the name of Brian Brushwood who mentioned that whenever he was looking for a new trick, he would just grab a magic book from like 1950 and be very confident that almost no one except for like Teller of Penn and Teller would remember it. So that, that kind of rings true. Uh, no, I don't really have any notable announcements. This is my 17th time seemingly reading this book. And before we started recording, I mentioned that I'm amazed at how much of any given book can fall out of my head, even if I read it two months ago. So uh, if I had access to, to basic mind magic, that would vastly improve the process of doing that. Yeah, that's all for me. Well, we are going to take a look today at uh, Tradition Book Virtual Adepts Revised. This is the final of the revised uh, tradition books in revised edition. Came out in 2003. It is uh, 100 pages like the other revised tradition books. It was written by Bill Maxwell and Gary Glass. And uh, I was thrilled because when I was a, a youngster, I was watching Greatest American Hero on uh, US TV, and there was a really cool character there, FBI agent named Bill Maxwell. And I thought, is it the same? No, no, it's, it's not. But it's still a cool name. So with that, I think we're ready for a walkthrough to take a look at this book. So this tradition book opens with a prologue entitled Stray Dog, where someone is attacked by a dog on the internet. One of the recurring themes in this book is kind of the representation of virtual space that had been laid down by books like Snow Crash, where the internet is kind of full of digital embodiments of things. And if you need to protect a piece of data, you have a fake guard dog. And if you need to circumvent it, you can summon a dog trainer or you can plug directly into it and pull a keyboard out of nowhere and uh, put on your sunglasses inside and type frantically and go into hacker vision and have techno music play and circumvent any threat that can approach you. The introduction is entitled Back to Basics. And this is a discussion of what the book is trying to, to lay out. And they say that the Avatar Storm forced a reevaluation. The first thing that got my nerd dar up is it kind of suggests that the digital web was downed by the Avatar Storm. And that is something this book mentions. That is corroborated by nothing else, as everything else in Revised kind of presumes that the digital web's uh, whiteout occurred before significantly the week of nightmares and was tied to kind of an explosion into Wizatep. But it mentions that the group is no longer new. They see the world mathematically and that the theme for the book is going to be deus ex machina. They, they want to bring wonder back to reality 2.0 and they want to get reality 2.0 up and running. And uh, they kind of broaden the definition of reality 2.0 to no longer strictly be let's all get on the digital web, which I kind of appreciated. And the mood is a dreamed hacked. 
they talk about how the Ali Batin clued in the rest of the traditions that the book of nature was written in numbers and that it was the nature of reality. But the problem with that was that the virtual adepts are still viewed as scapegoats by some members of the traditions for the things that the technocracy has done. Uh, that is something that came up in one kind of, and was never really mentioned again, and is back. And one of the recurring themes is this book grabs a bunch of stuff from one which certainly makes it more exciting, but a little bit on the uh, jarring side. Uh, we get a very brief lexicon, which I am. Then we get a outline of how the rest of the book is going to go. So chapter one is entitled Primer and is an overview. And this represents, uh, I think, the first swastika in Mage on the art on page 10. So I'm like, well, that came out of nowhere, um, especially when you're talking about a, a history chapter. They trace the origins of the virtual adepts back to the Dark Ages and then just kind of hand wave it away. But then they trace it back further to the Greeks with the advent of rigorous geometry, which was not quite ge uh, rigorous, and geometry actually predates it considerably. They make mention to Chinese algebra, which is, okay, yeah, the precursors of it will give you to it. Their precursors were big on the Gutenberg press. The virtual adepts kind of came out philosophically from an idea within the order of reason that sleepers would be able to har carry more than was being given to them. And they kind of take the instigating incident as the Missouri quakes of 1811, which are real events that occurred uh, between December 1811 and January 1812. And they purport to say that this was actually a group of technomancers who were trying to create an improvement in the area. And they wanted to shift some things geologically, maybe to uh, make it so that water navigation was easier or what have you. Caused a big ass earthquake. And the Order of Reason is like, what do we do with these guys? And the rest of the Order of Reason is like, we should promote them. And the rest of the Order of Reason is like, we should kill them. <laughs> so they, they split the difference and kind of made a new group out of it. They're real kind of like coming out party was after Charles Babbage, an electrodyne engineer in 1922, provided inspiration for the first uh, difference engines, which were kind of general purpose calculation machines. They were big on the advent of the telegraph. And then finally, the telephone, where Graham beat the technomancers to the punch, but then the virtual adepts kind of ran with it and created a, a giant network. And the virtual adepts claimed credit for that. It then kind of goes through a high level of involvement in the 20th century. It has an aside where it speculates on why the Society of Ether left, and it's like, ah, it was a scorned lover, and other people were like, ah, the Iteration X uh, was responsible for killing someone. And we also get the idea that the virtual adepts were involved with the United States becoming involved in World War One, with them being the people that who had decrypted the Zimmerman telegram, which was a memo that was sent to the German minister to Mexico that indicated like, ah, but you should do this during the war. And it was decrypted. The Americans found out about it. And they're like, I never. And their monocles fell out. And we all joined World War One Again, it considers the, it continues the idea of, of there being a very thick shadow history by saying that, that the chaoticians saw the uh, great stock market crash coming. They predicted the rise of Germany after the stock market crash and that the syndicate did not listen. The virtual adepts were infuriated by the advents of racial, of racial science and that the NWO is listed as partially responsible for the rise of Hitler. The virtual adepts misled the United States during World War II, so Japan would catch them by surprise, causing them to again enter another world war. Uh, but that some virtual adepts complicated the adventures of World War II by uh, treating the encryption between Axis and allies as a game. Over this period of time, the work of Alan Turing earned the trust of the Society of Ether. Society of Ether and the Society of Ether is responsible for uh, helping with the metallurgy required to create trinary decks. The virtual adepts wanted a new computer that only they would be able to understand that they could prevent from falling into the hands of their technocrat uh, colleagues, and trinary decks were born. The post-war history moves at a fair clip with, in 1947, the iterators seeing the adepts as being kind of loose cannons that need to be reined in. So they infiltrate it in 1950. Uh, Turing is is declared kind of an enemy by the technocracy saying that he needs to be killed. And then uh, one fateful night in the, the 50s, Turing is trying to download his computer into the web to show that virtual reality is kind of the base layer of reality. Uh, he's killed in the process by NWO agents who, who bust in. One of the theories is that his avatar being downloaded in the process of dying is kind of what powers the web and that in strange corners of it, you can still hear his screams. In 1955, the virtual adepts leave formally and in 57, they join the traditions backed by the Society of Ether in exchange for having to give them 
everything. Their modern history kind of includes a few basic strands. One is the idea that they were infected with what was called the Turing virus, which causes them to forget certain bits of hypermathematics and theoretical physics, and that caused them to become reliant on their technocratic foci. That eventually this was discovered and the uh, Tesla vaccine was disseminated and that has freed the virtual adepts in, in the modern era. Uh, another one is that they were behind the rise of science fiction and uh, in both books and film and that there was a long raging like war occurring between the NWO and the virtual adepts for control of sleeper society in terms of how new ideas about technology were propagated. The next one is the advent of the proper internet with ARPANET having been founded by the Iteration X, but there were a bunch of virtual adepts who were actually running the network itself. And then finally, you had the whiteout, which caused a massive reformatting of the digital web. Their history is short chronologically, but it has a, a bunch of meat on it. The reverence towards Alan Turing comes up again uh, with, with Turing being considered one of the greatest of their members. It goes into detail on the inspirational tactics that is used to inspire science fiction authors, which I thought was interesting, ranging from weird anonymous letters to uh, near-death experiences. I, I thought this was kind of an interesting aside. I think with a little bit of reframing, it could have been in a directly useful setting where your group is require, is trying to incept a certain idea in society. I don't know how, how well a lot of it would, would stay up, though. The second part of the chapter goes into how the virtual adepts are received around the world. Omaha is still listed as kind of like one of their spiritual homelands as a phone network exchange. The Crystal Palace has been moved away from being located there. They consider Silicon Valley the core of reality 2.0. They claim membership in every major American city, the good internet connection, but that Iteration X take, has taken over automotive manufacturing or is has an iron hold over it. So avoid that. And then the rest of the section kind of goes over certain stereotypes about internet access and technological availability throughout the world. Um, they mentioned that in Mexico, in Central America, quintessence gets sucked out faster, that Mexico City is thickly populated with vampires. Uh, the UK is a adept stronghold, but France is mixed. South Korea is important. Japan is heavily adept. Uh, and that Hong Kong is their, their hub in China, suggesting that the virtual adepts, the Wulong and the Wukang are all there at the same time. That seems like a potentially fun game. It then goes over it, kind of some of their, their views of how reality is going to work. It, it goes over the other traditions that they're particularly bitter about the celestial chorus, that they list ghosts as things that only exist on the web, and that they have kind of a basic internal setup that the reality crackers and explorers are responsible for kind of creating the ideas that will go up into reality 2.0. The cyberpunks will prep the masses for it. The cryptogramics help speed up the process, and the chaoticians anticipate problems. Uh, one of the interesting bits is they kind of go out through a, for lack of a better term, a virtual adept creation story, which says that at the core of reality is something called the correspondence point, and it consists entirely of information. Around it is hyperspace, which is a virtual space that shows uh, possible representations of it, and that the outer core or outer skin of this hypersphere is the Tellurian as we know it. And their goal is to let people be the masters of their choice to move around within that data sphere to achieve the outcome that they would like. Well, yeah, there was a lot here. Um, it started off saying the celestial chorus were the dictators that controlled the Western world and made everyone miserable. And uh, I just wanted to say that was debunked very nicely on page 109 of Guide to the Traditions. This chapter had as a, a framing device a young adept running a sort of virtual reality history learning program for an older, more experienced adept. And that introduced a lot of in-character chatter and descriptions of special effects that made this section a lot longer than it needed to be and irritating to read through when I'm trying to reference uh, history later on. This tradition book in within revised edition is much bolder about using shadow history than uh, most of the other tradition books. And by shadow history, I mean things that happened in the past that mages know about and sleepers just don't know anything about. So that was a lot of fun for me. Like, for example, the earthquakes in, I think it was Missouri, turns out that the virtual adepts were, at, were actually doing something and accomplishing something, but they just you know cover it over as a natural catastrophe. And uh, any other examples of that, I, I just think it's a lot of fun to put that in. It, as a storyteller, 
it gives me uh, material to work with in my chronicle. So I just love seeing it there. Now, of course, as Terry mentioned at the beginning, um, on page 30, there's a reference to the big whiteout in the digital web that happened as a result of the Avatar Storm in 2000. And of course, as Mage fans, we know that there was a major whiteout event in the digital web in 1997 when Doisetep fell. And so what this book does not make clear was were there two big whiteout events three years apart or was there only one and they want to move it three years into the future if there were two of them then uh, yeah two major whiteout events three years apart that would give a very good explanation for why so many mages including virtual adepts are very very shy about going on the digital web in fact this book came out in 2003 you know three years after the second one so people would probably be expecting another big whiteout event to come and they'd be very very nervous about that so that is two of those whiteout events would be a very good explanation for why there's much less people on the digital web and of course in the uh, revised edition, uh, there's an emphasis on mages should spend their time on Earth. They should not go off into magical worlds, even though the digital web is closer to being like our internet that we recognize. It is still technically in the world of mages inside the Umbra. It is a zone, not a layer of the Umbra. But so yeah, this is a good explanation for why there's less guys going there. And if there was only one major whiteout event, then... Um, Still, that's that's a good reason for why there are less virtual adepts hanging out on the digital web. So for Re Revised Edition, that does work. Now, when it comes to the Turing virus uh, that Terry mentioned, it is explained in this book that it is, it is one kind of pneumonovirus that the New World Order uh, cooked up uh, some years back, and they specialize in these pneumonoviruses or very high-level mental viruses that can be put into a number of people at the same time without them having to even really use computers uh, from what I from what I can see here. For me, this really looked like a plot device to explain how the virtual adepts got over their fascination with virtual reality and the internet and returned to mathematics and related pursuits. It also explains information wants to be free was a result of the Turing virus. Well, first off, info wants to be free is more than a juvenile catchphrase. Second, saying the other conventions also have a pneumonovirus and it keeps them in line. This is from page 23, a section called The Learning Cliff. I don't think that works too well. By now, every convention in the technocracy would have learned about the mental virus and removed it. This is a trick that works once, then everyone else catches on and watches for it. Third, the notion of virtual adepts being silly hackers with a fascination with VR is a common misconception, even among mage writers. The first tradition book makes it clear this isn't the case. So honestly, this is a, for me, this is another example of revised edition fixing a problem that I didn't have. After the history section, we get into virtual adept thought and uh, what they're doing today. The go-to section assumes that adepts use sleeper resources and do not have any resources of their own. I guess that's a reasonable assumption for revised edition. I remember in first edition, it specifically stated that the virtual adepts have their own infrastructure, their own information resources, and they don't have to rely on sleeper resources. They just use them when they want to. For me, the go-to section was a little too general, a little too high level. Uh, there were some examples of humor in there, which didn't stick for me. Even in 2003, we've all heard, oh, when you go to Mexico, don't drink the water. That, that joke was done to death 20 years ago. The baseball metaphor for uh, viewing the structure of the universe was, uh, was actually very intriguing for me. That was something I'd like to play with further. Um, I think that was a good idea. Now, the virtual adept goal of imposing one's perspective on the world as their reality 2.0 on Earth, it, it, they just gave like a, a line or two for what their goal was and how every single person can like superimpose their own perceptions onto the world and that will somehow make them happier or something if I read that right it, it doesn't for one it doesn't sound very useful to me and for two it sounds like it's kind of leaning into into solipsism like uh, the way I see the world is is the only way the world can be seen I think that would encourage that thinking in a lot of people and I'm not sure that's a good thing so yeah their their goal of the future earth I think there should have been more uh, space given to that so we could get a better understanding of what the authors have in mind because we're given just a really quick snapshot and I'm if I understood it correctly I'm not sure it's such a great thing but hey, again with such a quick snapshot out maybe I just misunderstood what the authors were trying to tell me when the virtual adepts look at the other factions of mages especially in the traditions it says what they think about the Akashic Brotherhood. And I thought that was really insightful. I was fascinated after reading that. But as soon as we get to the other traditions, it was simplistic, uh, snarky, and not very helpful. It even 
lean towards ignorance of what these other factions of mages would be like. And so, uh, yeah, the Akashic part was great, but after that, I was like, no, I, I think we ought to rewrite this. But, but that wraps up my thoughts on chapter one. Chapter two starts with a basic breakdown of members into two types, those who know the Kibos, who are responsible for, for knowledge collection, and then the hackers for those who use it. The hackers, they say, do things based on uh, reputation and and need, and that they kind of have a whole bunch of internal rules that they tend to follow. Uh, the book varies on the degree to which the group is just independent versus being kind of anarchist or a, a radical opposition to authority. And the, the basic rules they give are follow the leader if one exists, never challenge a leader during a conflict, don't let lame people stay in charge uh, to play nice with other people, uh, avoid revenge where reasonable, get out of politics if possible. And then it gets over a it goes through a section talking about like a lot of numerological correspondences and the idea is that uh, nicknames and so on are tied to patterns and that your name uh, the name that you use online can kind of be a link to your true name and that there's kind of a, a naming ritual where you discover who you are through through your name and its application and th that was kind of interesting but the uh, the correspondences they have are, are kind of shallow especially considering like the fact that you have access to someone's name online immediately so i would have liked a little bit more information on maybe like what a virtual adept true name is i think in modern times it would probably just be their private key they go over kind of the ranks or how the virtual adepts view the ranks uh, that you have the lame who is anyone besides the virtual adept or anyone who's struggling with the spheres the elites which are most of them the adepts that kind of sit above that joby or the job uh, which is apparently a stephen king reference and i think that the idea here was these are people that can be seen in multiple places and they, they they aren't to be messed with i think this is implied to either be archmasters or oracles i'm not entirely sure and then you have dropouts who are kind of everyone else the one thing that didn't happen here is normally this is where we would get like our cursory two paragraphs on sorcerers and i don't recall seeing any reference to that so a little bit of yeah a little bit of information there would have been would have been swell but the next section is entitled factions.lots.org and when i think in a, think of factions and i think of lots and i think of organization i think of adam simpson adam could you tell us about the factions <laughs> It's nice to be thought of. Okay, the virtual adept factions. They used to be called legions. Now they are called alts. Uh, alt is a reference to the early um, list serve uh, part of the internet before the web became popular. Uh, three remain from the first tradition book. The reality hackers are now the reality coders and the next explorers are new. Cyberpunks were all about anarchy and defiance to establish authority, but the Avatar Storm shook them up. Now they are rediscovering the ideals that inspired them in the early 20th century. Although still rough and forceful, their efforts against the technocracy are now directed towards exposing lies and injustices. They favor forces effects and have the least regard for sleepers when shaking things up. Cypherpunks got their start as a reaction to the technocracy crackdown on adepts after the Cyberpunk successfully took down Iteration X's master computer temporarily. The cypherpunks used advanced mathematics to hide adept locations and data streams from technocrat reprisals. For years, they continued to hide assets and clean up after the cypherpunks. In the early 90s, they stole data on neurolinguistics from the technocracy and discovered the pneumono virus that was crippling the virtual adepts. They are well trained in the mind sphere and strive to guide proper information flows. Chaoticians claim descent from the earliest mathematicians. When the order of reason began, there was a sublodge called the arithmeticians. The invention of the computer allowed them to pursue new branches of math that led them to discover a troubling X-factor. In 1960, the X-factor was realized to be a vital part of reality. Renaming themselves the Chaoticians, they embraced chaos theory and were able to predict dramatic changes, like the Avatar Storm. They have a solid understanding of the entropy sphere and use it in complex predictions. Reality coders, originally named reality hackers, first appeared in the 1800s but lacked the tools to realize their goals. The New World Order pneumonovirus took them out of commission, but they returned in the late 80s. They applied their techniques in the real world and met resistance from the many adepts working in virtual spaces. The Avatar Storm and shaking off the pneumonovirus helped adepts see the real world and virtual worlds were intrinsically linked. Changing their names to reality coders, they worked closely with the next explorers in a cooperative effort. They continue to study the foundational laws of reality to enhance virtual simulations. They now work to acclimate sleepers to the new world the adepts are building. 
Next Explorers got their start after Turing's discoveries in the 1940s. A majority of the adepts worked to build a better world and virtual space that they intended for humanity's future home. After whiteout crashes and resolving the pneumonavirus, the adepts see the digital web and Earth are intrinsically linked. They now work to simulate a better future Earth in the digital web. Cooperating with the reality coders, they pass their discoveries to be tested on Earth. They revel in their online freedom, but suffer quiet more frequently than other adepts. The next section covers politics, and they indicate that uh, a lot of the interactions are done, again, kind of as a, a free form, you need to prove it, uh, or we're going to make fun of you fashion. That once or twice a year, when adepts get together, they have a, a couple that is chosen as the Red King and the, and the Queen of Hearts, and their goal is to uh, run some sort of event where things are voted on, and the way you vote on it is basically by allocating process or power. That by having this virtual reality core war that combatants can, can gain control over whatever system is being used and try and set the rules, the idea being if you are good at this, you are likely a capable uh, virtual adept, you are good at magic, and that you should be in charge, which I thought was a uh, dumb at first, but kind of grew on me in terms of how things work. The way they depict a core war is kind of in the form of like an old shape-shifting duel where your goal would be to come up with a form and someone else would come up with a, a form that bested it. So they already went through the way in which you interact with other groups, and now they kind of present a, a code of ethics in the form of a bunch of statements, which is, I think, interesting because it's remarkably similar similar to the code of Ananda in that regard. Once, a, as Adam said, information will set you free, which is different than the information wants to be free. Information will set you free. The next one they have is dream the dreams that have never been dreamt, followed by the greatest good for the greatest number or the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few or the one. And then Kirk's response of the needs of the one outweigh the needs of the many, which is a remarkably Kirk thing to say. Nobody gets left behind. And then finally, he who fights monsters might take care lest he become a monster, which I liked because one of the recurring ideas here is that it is possible to be so anarchistic you kind of rebel against reality in such a way that you destroy yourself. I liked that. In the, the paradigm shift, we go over magic and again, how the adepts view reality. They consider computers to kind of serve as seeing glasses for the magically impaired, that they allow you to expand your, your senses and understanding, and that a lot of previous magic was people kind of shrouding the laws of the universe. Uh, they give a sphere walkthrough, and normally I don't go through these, but one of the things that I thought was interesting here is it includes two things. These are rank kind of in order of importance. Additionally, it gives you an idea of what resonance effects will look like and what form paradox may take. For instance, for correspondence, they mention that people who excel at this, one of the problems is correspondence is prone to paradox, and they tend to uh, look weird. Forces is useful in the digital web, but tends to make the users irritable and tends to result in random power surges that can be kind of destructive. Time makes you annoying as you mention things that are about to happen and can also manifest as lost time. Prime tends to treat things as ephemeral and colors tend to blend together around them. Mind mages tend to answer questions before they are asked and they often have a piercing gaze. Uh, entropic focused adepts tend to be wild risk takers and have odd things happen to them. Matter tends to have a Midas touch and cause a uh, ripple of weird external effects with the objects that come in contact with. Life mages tend to look better than normal, but they can transmit disease via magic. And finally, spirit mages talk to the invisible and they tend to seem haunted. I thought this was kind of an interesting idea. I don't know if I would have wanted all the other tradition books to do the same thing because nine traditions with nine spheres, I don't know if that would have gotten uh, hugely repetitive, but this is uh, something that's popped up in one or two places before, but this felt like one of the first, hey, we're going to really go down it uh, step by step and and talk to you about what an expert in this is kind of looking like. One of my questions is always, so what happens if you have four dots and two spheres? Do you just combine it together? Something like that? But I, I don't know. They also make a reference to Mount Ka which was previously mentioned kind of as the predecessor of the digital web, but here it is indicated as having been kind of an early shadow of the web. And they don't do a great job of, to me, explaining if the digital web is kind of so foundational what existed before it. I felt like that was, that was a, a little bit blurry. We then get two merits, which are kind of vague, well-connected, and prone to quiet. And then we get a bunch of rotes. Here, they do rotes that are both common, and then they break them down by factions. One of the ones I thought was interesting was Here Kitty Kitty, which is Correspondence 3, Mind 3, Time 3, which deals with a problem by bringing along a bigger problem. And that's certainly a way of, of dealing with things. We also get the Learn It rote, which uh, is kind of a curse placed on someone. Correspondence 2, Entropy 2, Prime 3, Time 2, which indicates that for each success on the casting, the target becomes a magnet for one skill-appropriate challenge per session. It could 
range from just a threatening scenario to to something much more terrifying. And this, uh, if you kind of follow through with it, has a pretty strong ability to absolutely destroy a Chronicle near instantaneously, especially if someone gets five or six successes with it. It's an interesting idea, but its persistence and power are a bit kind of above my preference. The final road I kind of want to note is Search Engine, which is Correspondence 2, Entropy 1, Prime 1. And I think Magic has a tough time dealing with any time the spell or effect seemingly needs to choose. So uh, effects of the kind you need to find this, I don't find magic well suited for. Like what what dot, what spheres would be required to do uh, to cast a lightning bolt at the person present with the highest avatar or something like that. Questions that kind of mix diegetic and non-diegetic questions like what exists in game and what doesn't. And the magic itself somehow making a determination and doing it is always something that like sat poorly with me. A bunch of the roads kind of remind me that we don't have a data sphere yet, and they kind of use a mix of forces and correspondence to, to get there. Like one of the Kibo roads is called core dump, and using forces you can just generate a whole bunch of meaningless data, which I guess kind of would make sense if you had precise application and you could flip ones and zeros indiscriminately. Some of the dots are also questionable to me. For instance, encrypt, which is a cyberpunk road, is mine three time three, and it's basically a mine shield, which historically has just been in mind one. We then get a bunch of uh, depth focuses, which makes sense. Their fondness for computers, musical instruments, PDAs, phones, voice assist thing. And a lot of them are just kind of variants of a computer anyway. We then get a few wonders. The first one is a wonder called Clockers, which allows you to store up quintessence. And I thought it was interesting that it said that if it stores too much paradox, it will explode doing 10 dice of damage to the mage and destroying the device it's attached to, uh, which indicates that when this thing goes off, it is roughly equivalent to a pound and a quarter of TNT based on M20 rules. Congratulations, you've discovered one of the most potent explosives, and it happens to be a small processing unit. We get two uh, familiars, which I, I thought was, was kind of neat, and that brings us to the end of the chapter. Starting off chapter two, the adept anarchy and authority sidebar uh, challenges the notion of total anarchy and mindlessly challenging authority. Adepts do, after all, need to get things done, and that's why I appreciated this sidebar. When talking about tr adept true names, I think it was nice to see the recognition of avatar essences. I, I like that, that, I guess you could say, um, small way of bringing in some of the Mage the Ascension's mysticism into the adepts, because they can do sphere magic. It does make sense that they would get into mysticism in a limited fashion, so I thought thought that was cool to see. I usually don't talk about the art in these books, but there was one that just stood out so much that I, I cannot ignore it. Um, Terry, take a look at uh, page 51. There's an illustration showing you a typical member of the Chaoticians. That is one hip individual. Uh, that, that, is, that is pretty darn amazing. I mean, Terry, I've known you for a few years and you're a pretty hip guy, but are you that hip? I assume by hip, you make reference to the pants, the fact that this person <laughs> is wearing loose fit, low rise jeans. And the only way to have that happen is if they had like angular, sharp hips that would be capable of slicing bread. Uh, audience, <laughs> I will attempt to paint you a word picture. This person is wearing a, this is a, 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 what appears to be a male presenting person with dark triangular shades, a lower lip piercing, a, a, a necklace collar that I forgot that those were a thing, a correspondence t-shirt, but it is a, a, a ringer style t-shirt where the neck and armbands are different colors. They're wearing what appears to be a short sleeve crop top hoodie, which is a fashion choice where you're like, I want to stay warm, but not my wrists or my belly button. They are then wearing, I wouldn't quite say fat Jenkos in terms of it, but the exit to the jeans are significantly wider than most uh, pant cut would suggest. We cannot see the shoes, which is interesting because throughout much of the artwork, these people have thick meaty souls um <laughs> if uh, the trope of some because of those trousers exactly exactly <laughs> um there is an interconnected set of devices that are attached uh, throughout the person's pocket attached to a waist belt i have no concept of what those devices are and the longer i look at it the less i know what they are i think adam has created some sort of pneumovirus to try and uh, cause obsession within me and if i have a stroke within the next 24 <laughs> hours i will know his subtle magics have worked but it's quite the figure uh, on top of that the character's right pinky is bent in a direction that i don't think fingers can actually bend in which again the more i stare at it the more menacing it is 
And then eight <laughs> of their digits have some sort of wrap around like the first and second knuckle, which makes me think that they're using some sort of computer device or this person is so fashionable, they are wearing a type of jewelry that does not yet exist. Both of these are perfectly acceptable. And behind them is the Serpinski triangle. So I think that's perfectly acceptable. This illustration, I was looking at it, I was thinking, okay, this person is using like all nine spheres to manifest so much coolness in one time, uh, in one place, that he is risking a terrible paradox backlash. So listeners, do not try that at home. Um, page 50 makes reference to the technocracy being against new fields of mathematics. I'm not exactly sure why the technocracy would be against that. I, I, if I was thinking of things that would rile up the technocracy, that, that's just not on my list. But um, I'm actually not comfortable with the idea that the digital web is now only for modeling improvements for Earth. The idea that the digital web is a new world with its own rules is not only interesting to me, but shakes off the assumption that the world we are familiar with is the only one that matters. Matters. So, yeah, that, that is a concept that is uh, mentioned a couple of different times uh, throughout this book. Not, not sure how I would grapple with that one as a storyteller. Might pass it by. Uh, the Code of Ethics is uh, good. A little simplistic in places, but a very good starting place for ethics that makes sense to the virtual adepts and are not, you know, joined at the hip to some uh, previous culture or religious structure. So I, I thought that was very nice, actually. The VA punishment sidebar on page 55, I thought was excellent. It is very believable, and it is a glimpse into an information-based economy rather than a, I guess you could say, money or currency-based economy. It's basically saying if one of the virtual adepts steps out of line and does something that uh, is, is a terrible thing, then the other virtual adepts have a specific way of setting someone on his trail, investigating it, reporting it to others, and then dealing with it. And there are uh, transactions of information between different parties along this process. I'm not going to describe the whole thing in detail, but very, very interesting, very believable. That is something I definitely want to use in my games. I'm so glad they took the time to type up that sidebar. Interesting idea on page 56. They mentioned that modern telecommunications is a way of the sleepers making use of the correspondence point, which of course is, has always been a part of Mage. It was mentioned in the first edition core book that the virtual adepts were all uh, nuts about their discovery of the correspondence point. So that was an interesting idea to play with possibly. On page 56, they have a uh, mention of paradigm for the virtual adepts. And that, if I read it right, it, it confuses me. For one thing, how does it explain doing magic in the physical world in the virtual adept ideal future? It, it kind of sounds like straight no focus will working, in which case, isn't that no paradigm? Or uh, you know, maybe I just need to talk with some other mage fans and work through the concepts here if I didn't understand it properly. But that, that one was not working too well for me. Okay, on page 57... A number of adepts use technological foci to get this done, computers, telephones, etc. But all you really need is the ability to juggle the mathematical equations in your head. Then all hell can break loose, end quote. Uh, in first edition, you can say this, but not in revised edition. In revised edition, mages can't drop any focus until Arete 6. Most mages never reach that level. And the few that have, uh, most of them were taken out by the Avatar storms. So I think any virtual adept making this argument... To other virtual adepts would be seen as some sort of a fringe nut. I don't think they'd even listen to him. Let's see, page 57, the way the time sphere works contradicts uh, this space-time theory. You can go forward in time, but you cannot go back in time. And that was, was not addressed on page 57 when they were talking about their theory of time. Page 57, I love the quip against the Batini. It is uninformed, it is dismissive, and very in character. I thought that one was great. Uh, an ongoing theme through uh, the first three editions of uh, Mage the Ascension is this idea that the virtual adepts have moved into the Batini's former playground. And the Batini say, hey, uh, you whippersnappers are playing with our toys. And the virtual adepts are saying, uh, no, you old guys are confused. We're doing our own thing and we don't have anything to do with you. And so it, it's nice to see a reference to that uh, in Revised Edition. This chapter actually gave me a new respect for the 10th sphere of information mentioned on page 27 of the first virtual adept tradition book. Uh, back when I read that first tradition book, I was like, oh yeah, everybody needs a 10th sphere. Yeah, I don't see how this one would work. But after reading this revised virtual adept tradition book, um, I'm actually ready to revisit that notion because it's given a little more meat here, although I think they did that unintentionally. 
Let's see, this section pushes against the individual paradigms advanced by much of revised edition, which I'm fine with actually. Group paradigms uh, is, is kind of a natural fit for me with, with my mindset, but there were many heavy detailed sections in revised edition books before this that explain that individual paradigms is how we're, we're going to be looking at this. And this book just sort of naturally falls into the groove of talking about group paradigms and not so much personal paradigms. And so that was, it, it was interesting t- for me to note that. I, I wonder how much the two authors were on the same page as uh, other revised edition authors. I thought it was interesting to note the virtual adept discomfort with the entropy sphere. Now, this is this is not like a minus. It's not uh, a prohibition from using it. It's just discomfort. It's like the way they like to look at the world and then you get in this entropy sphere and it's talking about decay and random uh, probabilities and things like that. And it's, it's just not something they're comfortable with, even though it's something that they can use. I thought that was cool. Uh, there's a new knowledge introduced in this chapter, virtual space. And for me, it was the description of that new knowledge was so vague that I'm just inclined to uh, let it down and, and not make use of it. I, I think there are other ways uh, to approach this. Uh, let's see, we've got three rotes that stood out for me. One is a core dump. Uh, Terry mentioned this. So uh, when you're threatened by uh, someone, uh, especially another uh, technomancer, uh, the virtual adept will dump a whole bunch of information that, that seems important, but is actually just a lot of, of clutter. I thought that was pretty cool and very appropriate for virtual adepts. Uh, there's one rote called web crawlers. Uh, which allows them to make use of these um, small, minor uh, umbral spirits they find in uh, digital web and other virtual spaces, but they don't really understand them very well. In fact, virtual adepts argue over how this rote even properly should be understood. And so I thought that was cool. It was kind of a recognition of how complex and mysterious um, the umbra is, even the internet-looking parts of the umbra. Uh, And then there's the rote THWACI, which is a -A T-W-A-C-I. It's an acronym. Um, it, basically, it's a rote that uh, uses uh, correspondence and other spheres to make your opponent feel like the space that they are in is actually closing in on them. And because the other sphere is used, uh, it can do actual physical damage to them, although not a lot, but it certainly does reinforce the illusion, making this um, a fascinating rote, making very clever use of correspondence, which of course the virtual adepts are supposed to be very good at. So I thought that rote was cool. I would like to play with that in a game. The foci section for me was rather weak. However, they did have one very cool concept that I am going to run with. It's called the infranet. And that is when you basically you walk into a you walk outside in a big city and you look around. There are different uh, street signs. Um, buildings are painted different ways. Different advertisements for private businesses on the sides of buildings. There's graffiti. There's um, random damage patterns to to buildings. You know, cracks on the sidewalk or, or other sorts of things. And so all of this can work together to make a sort of. Uh, informational environment that someone who's trained in it can make use of. So it's kind of like an internet that's analog and offline in a sense. And I thought that was so cool. I would really like to make use of that. I think that was that could be something that some mages would get a lot of use out of, but other mages would not even understand the concept or know that it is there. And so definitely want to make that a part of my games. I wanted more uh, chaotician and reality coder uh, foci and, and paradigm. The chaoticians and the reality coders are virtual adepts who are not using computers as much, or at least they don't focus on them as much. Uh, They do stuff in the the real physical world, uh, not so much with information networks. And so I, it would have really helped me to see what foci do they like to use and, and how what is their approach to paradigm? Is it different from the rest of the virtual adepts? Because it seems like it kind of would be. Uh, and this book didn't give me a lot about that. And so I, it really would have helped me to have that. Wonders are great. There is one called the ICOE. It is kind of quiet rescue device. It says a lot of adepts in, in chapter two are prone to quiet. And so they... The virtual adepts created this wonder as a sort of device that will help mages who are not suffering from quiet to go into the quiet of their uh, colleague and and rescue that person or at least help him grapple with with what he's going through. So I I really like that. That was very cool. That was chapter two for me.
Chapter three is entitled Gurus and Gremlins and is about uh, notable people and what's going on within the group and is broken up kind of into three sections. The first is the elite of the elite. Uh, we get information on Catherine Blass, which was mentioned in the previous tradition book. Uh, their MO has kind of changed and it gives multiple conflicting background stories. This is one of the longest character sheets that we've gotten in Mage. It clocks in at well, uh, well over two and a half pages with relatively small artwork, indicates that Catherine uses a pair of online handles, Excel and Xtab, both based on Mayan goddesses, is kind of presented as the de facto leader, but never kind of gives us information on what that is like. The other one is Jacob Hunter Burnell, who is a character who is a third generation adept, which is interesting because the group's been around long enough, and also their history is extended back far enough that they now have two centuries of history that you could have someone who's has kind of a, a long lineage with the group based on those who come before it. We get a uh, bad boy boogeyman character in the form of Dark Vengeance, who is responsible for uh, creating a bunch of viruses and that people were nearly onto uh, this this pair of murderous twins until the whiteout kind of erased a lot of the background information that could be used to, to track them down. We get a urban primitive character. The All Adept Chronicle, we get some ideas on, on, on what that can look like, whether it comes down to acting as the tradition's police or going on a, uh, a adventure to to kill Nafandi, which they refer to as bug hunts, or do some sort of daring caper. That is that is certainly there. And it kind of gets a, a group called Cell V, which is a uh, one of the things that's been presented a couple times within the tradition books are the ideas of kind of chantries that are being re-inhabited, and uh, Cell V is one of those. It was started in 1984 originally by someone taking the A team concept and running with it, where they would just solve problems. And that kind of ended in a bloody mess and in 1994 a small adept group took over their chantry and started operations again uh, and it mentions that periodically it'll uh, still have hauntings where like Selvi will appear on a mirror in blood or what have you that there are a handful of them and that they do the the same kind of, of problem solving and we get a whole bunch of of characters for that and then we get a, a relatively meaty rant section and this kind of replaces the the myths and legends we get information on demon seed elite which came up before as kind of this digital entity that would come and mess you up if you came across as lame in its presence or or was notified to it here it suggests that the demon seed elite is a demon that may be way older than that and that it's a it could be a long-standing historic legend that is kind of found embodiment in the digital web which i like there's a, a side on how vampires and shapeshifters are uh, adepts or mages that have traded access to freed themselves from paradox by giving up variability in what they can do um, the phrase they use here is by hard coding their powers they have bypassed paradox uh, they talk about how the rogue council is is bothersome and they're like, ah, oh, why can't we figure this out? That the virtual space that the digital web occupies may not be quite as empty as people think it is and that there are these kind of these uh, data ghosts that have existed in this virtual space. Another idea is that the digital web is just the incubation spot for something greater. Uh, they refer to the, the cosmic omelet, kind of the idea that the, the digital web is incubating uh, something and in its infinite space, something is growing. They also talk about the idea of, of metaverses, that there may be multiple universes running around and what does ascension even mean? The avatar storm could be a collision between two of these universes and uh, does the correspondence point even make sense as an idea if there are multiple universes running around? And the answer is we don't, we don't know. It also mentions the idea that there could be other pneumoviruses running around out there and that some want to either engineer new ones or figure out what other ones are uh, are running around within the technocracy and that they hope to infect the technocracy as a whole where other traditions think that there's actually a second latent virus that is going to result in them returning to their technocratic masters, which I think is kind of an interesting idea, but again, kind of plays up that one-y idea of... They're still being, uh, the virtual adepts still being questionable despite having been part of the traditions now for 60 years, um, I guess 50 years at the time of this writing. We then get the, the character templates that are uh, fine, um, and that rounds out the chapter. Adam, what did you think about chapter three? 
This is the best chapter three I've seen in a revised edition trad book uh, possibly ever, but but certainly for a long while. It, it, it's a shame for me that this was like the last tradition book. If it was the first, they could have held it up as a high water mark for the, the writers working on the later ones. But uh, no, just just really like chapter three in this book. Uh, big thumbs up. Okay, let's get specific. Uh, there's a section elite of elite, which is, is basically the who's who of our uh, tradition. And in the past, that has been like historical footnotes. This fascinating person lived hundreds of years ago, and now they're dead. And uh, in this in this case, um, the writer said, you know what, forget that. We're going to do something new here. We're going to give the elite of the elite people who are alive now that your players can meet and interact with. And not only that, why don't we make them interesting? No, I really like the elite of the elite here. I assume they were going to throw in Dante again. It's like, I like the Dante character, but it's like, I already know who he is. But no, they said, you know what? You guys know who Dante is. Let's skip Dante. We're going to tell you about these other characters. Catherine Blass, I think, has shown up in books in the past. So she's a recurring character, but an interesting one. And there are a lot of uh, mostly new ones here. These characters have, well, not only they're very interesting, but plot hooks are written into their descriptions. I mean, multiple plot hooks and good ones. It's like after reading through this, it's like, why would I leave this on the table? I'm going to put this in my next game if I'm working with virtual add-ups because this is darn good material. Okay, so let's move on. There is information about uh, working with stories that involve the concept of quiet, which of course is, is a sort of, of special insanity that only mages can experience. Sleepers cannot suffer from quiet. Uh, I was thinking about how quiet center st stories can work really well on the digital web. It's not like the rest of the Umbra, and it's not quite like physical earth. And so I thought it was really appropriate for them to talk about it here. I, I liked that material. They have an all virtual adept cabal section uh, what you could do. And this is in every revised uh, tradition book, but they did a really good job of it here. Reading through the ideas of what you could do with an all virtual adept cabal, a lot of ideas, very good ones. Uh, this is high quality stuff. So I was very pleased to see that. The sample cabal is great. Uh, sometimes we get good ones, sometimes meh, but this one was really nice. It is a cabal, uh, like Terry said, they're, they're trying to right wrongs and help the helpless in uh, some modern big city. You pick which one. I thought it was very nicely done. There's also a sidebar, like a tale of what happened in the past to this sample cabal, and I, I just loved it. Great plot hooks in there. They have a techno nefandus villain in there, which is appropriate as a villain for virtual adepts. I thought it was just great. I assumed that in such a modern forward thinking tradition we would either not have legends or just have like maybe one legend like we've seen in some past books no we get eight of them and of course they get renamed as rants but I, come on it's the legend section and oh man great stuff i love this so many really interesting ideas i thought they would just like cut out demon seed elite because you know that's old hat but no they not only do they include it but they update it and say this spirit is older than we thought and it's not just some uh, mage who's going around hurting people also mentioned this notion that there's a new concept called the metaverse, and this challenges the previously cherished notion of the correspondence point as explaining how we understand uh, you know, physical space and the correspondence sphere. I really like that. I, I think it's time that the correspondence point got challenged by a group of mages that are so modern, forward thinking, and open to new ideas. So uh, yeah, chapter three was just gold star for me. Loved this one. Okay, uh, Terry, Terry, your uh, general thoughts on this book? This book feels very first edition in an updated way. It adds a energy and excitement to the virtual adepts that I certainly enjoy. The narrative voice of it being a VA book that is a cheerleader for the VA is a little bit too strong for me. The we're awesome at everything all the time, other people just need to get out of their way is a bit much. Uh, my, my, my taste for that in-world fiction and that in-world view tends to uh, frame, it tends to drop over time. There's not a lot of serious consideration, it feels, of the group's uh, weaknesses are flawed. I had never considered the maybe there were two whiteouts theory before, and that makes perfect sense that there could have been one in 97 and another one in 99 during the week of nightmares. I think pneumoviruses at first, I thought this was really stupid because I'm like, oh, there's a secret virus. It's like, it, it felt like one of those weird, uh, like comic book things or daytime uh, soap opera things where it's like, oh, it was all a dream. But like, the more I think about it, I'm like, no, that makes perfect sense. And uh, one of the things that has always got me about the breakup of the factions in Mage is becoming a Nefondus once you step through the calls is irreversible. Becoming a Marauder once you wrap yourself in quiet is irreversible. What is the static version of that? And one of the things I thought is, what if the moment you become a T4 
in the technocracy, you are so valuable that you get one of these pneumoviruses or something similar. You are told about it. And there is an, oh, by the way, uh, if you ever rebel against us, uh, we, we are just going to wipe everything that you know, and you're going to either be this drone or something like that, or, or something else bad happens. And I, I think there is... A, a symmetry to that and an interesting plot device that can that can come out of that and certainly the paranoia that comes with hey uh this one existed and it took him a while to figure out what other ones could be running around and now every technocrat who joins the traditions is considered suspect like look at simon Payne. like what happens when the kind of functional primus of the celestial chorus happens to be a former technocrat what does that do this book on the whole shows the power of people who don't seemingly feel bound by the canon in some places this creates contradictions but in other places it creates some wild opportunity and as more time has gone on in mage the fact that it is not internally consistent i'm not going to say is a strength but once you find enough things that don't quite match up you stop worrying at least i do about getting it right. And in a strange way, that's kind of freeing, which feels uh, to fit with the virtual adepts. Uh, the tradition book does suffer from the fact that being a technomantic group, they are bound by the state of current technology. And that is one of those things that you just kind of have to update periodically. Full cards on the table. I am the author for the virtual adept section of Lore of the Traditions that will come out in eventually. So th this is a book I've spent a lot of quality time with, along with the first tradition book, Lore of the Traditions, and a few other texts like the digital web. And when I was starting that project, I looked through the previous text. I'm like, ho-hum, blah, 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 blah. But like the revised book gave a lot of options. Like it... <laughs> It ran with some stuff, and and I certainly appreciate that. On the whole, it was big, it was messy, it was fun. The frame narrative, I thought, was a little bit wordy at times. I thought, as Adam mentioned, it spent a lot of times describing visual effects, and few things are less interesting to me than an author using text to explain what an image on a computer looks like. That just feels like, at a very basic level, kind of kind of wrong. Kind of my, my high level. What about you, Adam? I agree that there was a lot of uh, first edition influence kind of brought into this book. Uh, when I read the two authors' names, I was thinking, I, I don't recall a lot of what they have written for Mage before this. And uh, now I'm not saying only old time authors can write for Mage, but it's just that that might help me explain why there's so much first edition influence kind of getting tugged into this. They uh, you know, seem to uh, be looking at all of the editions of Mage rather than focusing on revised edition, which I felt like a lot of revised edition authors were doing. Yeah, pulling in some of those notions from the earlier days of Mage, sometimes it got kind of contradictory and odd, and other times it was it was made it interesting. Um, I now understand this push we heard about previously to update the virtual adepts. Uh, we uh, had an episode in our podcast where we interviewed one of the authors of this book, and he said that at the time he was uh, starting to write it, the uh, mage developer let him know, look, we really want to update um, the, the image of the virtual adepts, and, and I want you to focus on doing that in this book. So I kind of understand that now. Uh, back when Terry and I were doing Tomes of Magic, and we looked at the first virtual adept uh, tradition book, uh, which was the first tradition book for Mage, we were playing with that idea. It's like, how much of this needs to be updated? And at the time, I didn't feel like it was terribly out of date. I felt like it was something I'd like to use in my games. However, after reading the, this book, now I do get what's going on here. Uh, this book updates the image or the, the style of the virtual adepts, but the underlying concept, I felt there was not a, a big shift here. Uh, this is the update that I think a lot of people will really benefit from. However, it's not something that I necessarily feel like I need. Um, to try and explain, think of a piece of candy. It's got a cellophane wrapper around it. A lot of people, they see the wrapper and that is what they see. Uh, and I guess in a sense, uh, at times I can see through the cellophane and see the candy inside the wrapper, and I'm focusing more on that. The first virtual adept tradition book said, look, the virtual adepts are not all about VR and internet. They are also using advanced mathematics. They're using chaos math. Uh, they're doing a lot of things um, offline and, and getting impressive results with it. And they had the reality hackers and the, the other cypherpunks and, and other stuff like that. And so I thought, oh, okay, it's not just on the internet. I get it. But a lot of people were reading past material on the virtual adepts like, oh, it's all about VR. It's all about the web. Hey, let's, let's let them grow into something more. And so this book gave them that. So a lot of mage fans are going to benefit from this book. I'm glad it was written. But again, for me, it solved a problem I, I didn't really feel like I, I had 
So I'm not going to complain about it. I'm just going to say it wasn't as necessary for me as, as it was for a lot of people. This intrinsic link between the physical world and the virtual online world, especially the digital web, that came across as a rather clumsy plot device for me because they said, this link is here. And that's why the reality coders and the next explorers are, are doing this project of theirs. But then it didn't say anything more about that. It's like, well, how did they learn that that's the case? Uh, what can I do with this in, in rotes or in, you know, story-wise in my games, plot threads or anything? It's like, no, they just said, this is the case. Now let's move on. And so because of that, it to me, it came across as a, a clumsy plot device. However, I shouldn't complain too much because it did help keep things on track for revised edition, which is mages focus on earth. They don't wander into the umbra and get fascinated with that. So it's appropriate. It's just not something that thrills me so much. I thought it was really, really neat that we saw some interesting hints, especially in chapter three, that the line dividing the virtual adepts and the technocracy may be a lot more blurry than most people think. There's uh, like a member, I'm trying to remember, there's one of the elite of the elite who um, is like a part-time technocrat and a part-time virtual adept. And uh, because he has a high erite, he can get away with that. And there were other suggestions of that here and there in the book. Not a major theme the book was shouting about, but I thought that was really interesting. What if there are uh, groups in the technocracy and groups in the virtual adepts who are passing each other information, uh, working things out day by day. Maybe, maybe this hostility and enmity between them is overblown and uh, maybe even a screen for some interesting things going on. So I like that idea. And this book uh, does a couple of different places emphasize how modern virtual adepts use uh, music, especially digital music, as a, a foci and sort of a not, not a paradigm, but a, a way of approaching magic uh, more than just foci. And I thought that uh, really worked for me. Since doing this podcast, um, I've been working more with audio software, audio editing software, example, for example, that I, I had never dealt with before. And when you are a musician, the way you work with analog instruments like a traditional guitar uh, drum set, etc. Et it's quite different than uh, the digital instruments and especially the digital software. And so music, uh, electronic music is different from traditional music. And so for virtual adepts to work with the repeating rhythms, the emotional influences of different tunes, the, the very different uh, programmatic way of approaching tunes, rhythms, etc. that is different from traditional, I, th I, I really got fascinated by that reading this book. So I want to thank the authors for turning me on to that idea. I think as a player or as a storyteller, I could, I could have some fun with that in my games. This book really drove home the point that virtual adept players should be approaching their storyteller, uh, either during games or, or between games, and asking for opportunities to gather data. I think that is something that is important for virtual adepts. They, they need to be talking to their storyteller saying, hey, look, you know, during downtime or during this part of this story, um, my character is going to put some effort into gathering some data, just sniffing around to see if there's anything really good that I can hold on to. And the storyteller doesn't have to, you know, launch into a one-on-one a -on -one private session to do that. But the storyteller can kind of keep track of, oh, you'll find some good data here, but not here. And I'll work that into the story later because virtual adepts care less about currency and more about data for their unique kind of economy. And so I think players should, should key into that. And I think it can add a lot to a game uh, once a storyteller kind of gets used to the idea. And uh, last off, I was actually disappointed to see this notion that the traditional expression information wants to be free was was nothing more than a juvenile catchphrase. It's like something that hackers say when they piss people off uh, just to sort of you know thumb their nose at them. It's like, no, in my understanding, there, there really is more to that expression. It, it's this notion that there is something about information that causes it to be known by people. And uh, with modern technology, modern infrastructure and techniques, that trend is accelerating and it's worth taking note of that. And it might even give us clues to the nature of reality. I thought that was something really interesting to play with in the earlier editions of Mage. But this book sort of dismisses it as, oh, that was a delusion. We're over that now. Forget it. It's more than that to me. That was something that stood out to me multiple times uh, as I was reading through this book and it was treated that way. 
But I don't want to suggest that the authors were dim bulbs because after reading this book, I know that was not the case. They had a lot of fascinating material here and a lot of great plot hooks and story material uh, for mage players. Uh, Again, chapter three was just amazing for me. I I just want to read it again for inspiration for any technology-focused mage stories I might run. Definitely worth it. So with that, um, I did have three story ideas that I was thinking of this week to um, involve with the virtual adepts. Uh, Number one, younger adepts are surprising older ones with impressive new rotes using chaos math in ways that confound even the chaoticians. They're also setting up new realms on the digital web that use fractal patterns to grow in size without becoming unstable. As some speak of a new movement starting, the players see more and more links between the new techniques and servers in Central America. Investigations show the Central American servers host unhealthy digital realms and produce net spiders that reproduce at a frightening rate. Whether the players travel to Central America or investigate it digitally, they learn a group of Nefandi are using technomagic of their own to exploit aspects of clopothic entropy to enable new techniques through digital networks. Not only are they spreading tainted rotes to young adepts, but they are also enlarging a realm in the digital web that lies near the low umbra. This digital realm is increasing its links to established digital realms. Can the players learn how these new rotes work without getting too deep into clopothic influence? Can they take down the threat without turning a large number of young adepts against them? Time to brush up on your Spanish. Number two, one of the players, preferably a Technomage, realizes they have no memories of five days out of last month. During that time, no one they know talked to them and their computers were not used. Even magic only shows them sleeping then. The players soon learn they are being spied upon by both the technocracy and virtual adepts. They intercept data claiming the player with the memory hole is an ally of D-Rez, an adept that went rogue after snatching data on the technocracy's Operation Fresh Start. D-Rez is in adept custody now, but Nothing can be learned from him. Both the adepts and technocracy are after the players. Did d use the player's head to store data? What is Operation Fresh Start? The only clues to go on are the player is deathly afraid of cell phones, has a strange craving for Erd Cola, and the spy's demise in the digital web is making public promises that this player will not disrupt their gathering in two weeks. Creative problem solving is needed as the players try to avoid their pursuers and get their hands on the truth. Number three, adepts are noting an increase in the number of mobile data constructs in the digital web. They are converging on several distant points in the digital web's unique geography, but no pattern can be discerned. When an adept from the chaoticians claims to know what's going on, her explanation is laughable. The chaotician corners the players, desperate to have a chance to explain the whole story. She proves to the players with her mathematical model that the new kinds of data constructs are moving to what is effectively one point so they can combine their data to start a chain reaction that will cause another whiteout event. But void engineers are observing the process closely in altering technocracy digital networks to assist the coming chain reaction. When the players learn the new data constructs have their origin in areas where the next floors and reality coders are simulating aspects of Earth, they see the digital web itself is reacting. Can the players get to the bottom of this before the whiteout event occurs? When the void engineers offer to work with the players, is that a good thing? Are the next floors simulations deeply flawed or just in need of adjustment? Well, that's three ideas for me. Hopefully those will kickstart some ideas of your own. So what are we reading next, Adam? Well, next we are reading the last mage book of all. It is called Ascension, and I know it's the last one. I was reading the intro, and it says, this is the (laughs) last book for mage. Very clearly signed. I'm not going to argue with that. And I assume we're done as a show after that, because your introduction is working hard towards Ascension, so you don't have to, and we will have gotten to Ascension. So Yeah, I guess guess the the bubble bursts at that point. We're going to have to figure out uh, what comes afterwards. Luckily, White Wolf was purchased by CCP, so we have the, the four more revised tradition books, and then we're doing Sorcerer's Crusade? Was that the plan? So wait, you're saying that there were four more revised edition books after the last book. Are you telling me the time sphere is real? Uh, both the time sphere is real, and beyond ascension, you have the technocrats. Which I don't know. I don't know how I feel about that as a metaphor, but they're fun books. <laughs> so I look forward to getting that, getting to those. I'm gonna be thinking about that all day now. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, We are so thankful to our supporters uh, for helping us out with this. And uh, Terry, can you give us the updated list of those people? I would like to offer thanks to Alex Gordon, Anders S., Andrew Andelstein, Andy, Birdo, Boogers, 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 Brendan Morrill, Bryce Perry, Chris Zack, Dan Svensson, Dennis Osborne, Entropy underscore Prime, Freddie, Gabrielle Palazzaro, Garga Lenoir, Guy Conan Stewart, Ian, Isabella Castillo, Jason Kennedy, Jason W. Biggs, Jay Sunsern, Jenna F., John Horton, John Magnuson, Josh Golden, Josh Hillerup, Josh Heath, 
Carl Halperin, Leslie Weatherstone, Michael Credle, Michael Parker, Nibero, Neil Patterson, Nikita Klamanov, Ralph Scheinhammer, Richard Bad Brewster, Ryan Hilton, Ryan Kendi, Samuel Tobin, Stephen Carton, William Connolly, William Martin, and W. Starter. I'd also like to uh, offer special thanks to our Oracle supporters, Christopher Phillips, who is the Oracle of exploding processor cores that do 10 times of damage upon observing too much paradox, and Buck Farmer, Oracle of text descriptions of sci fi effects that occur within computer programs in mage books well if you would like to become an executive producer for mage the podcast it would help us to keep bringing you episodes you would also become a part of our own council to discuss discuss upcoming projects the link in the show notes will get you started if you have something to say please contact us at mage the podcast at gmail.com with your questions comments or feedback subscribe to mage the podcast on itunes google play tune in and other aggregators if you like the show others might like it too so when you leave reviews for us it helps make us more visible in other people's searches and we would certainly appreciate it you can follow us on twitter at Mage the Podcast. We're also on the web at magethepodcast.com where you can listen to past episodes in the order in which they aired and see the complete show notes that we prepare for you. Well, thanks everyone for listening. Until next time, truth until paradox, baby. Go take first edition elements and jam them into your current game, assuming they make it fun and jam as many plot hooks as you can find along the way. Bye.